Good morning, bear with us as I give everybody some time to enter the room. We'll get started in just a moment. Good morning and thank you for joining us. For those of us with Vigilant Fire and EMS Training in CypherWorks Incorporated, we wanna welcome you to our eight week webinar series, Managing Fire Service Training. We appreciate you for joining us for the informative workshop. Each week we'll provide some training on a different aspect of managing your fire service program. Each week you'll receive an email with a certificate Please keep those for your professional development records. Please use the chat function if you have any questions or need anything as we will be monitoring the chat. At this time, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Todd Smith who will be leading the training. Todd is the CEO and founder of Vigilant Fire Service Training and he has 28 years of fire service experience. He's also a certified New York State Municipal Fire Instructor. instructor. Thanks so much for joining us today and take it away, Todd. All right, thanks, Chris. And I wanna welcome everybody to this webinar as well. Uh, today, we're gonna to discuss managing the fire service training program. We're gonna go over a five-step process for how to manage your training program. And then we're gonna dive really deep into one of those steps of managing the process, the needs assessment. And you're gonna hear in the background some buzzers and bells going off as I am doing this web webinar from a live firehouse today. Uh, so be prepared to hear some of that. So let's get started. So uh, managing your fire service training program, it is an intense job. Uh, managing the fire service training program is probably one of the most intense things uh, that somebody could take on within the fire service. It's a, it's a real labor intensive job if it's done correctly. Uh, and I, you know, we started off this conversation talking about, uh, have you ever heard this when you go to a fire, uh, to your firehouse for your training? Uh, have you ever heard uh, what are we doing for drill tonight? If you have heard that, what are we doing for drill tonight, then your fire service training program might not be managed as effectively or as efficiently as it possibly could. Okay, That's because managing the fire service training program is the most time consuming task in the fire service. Uh, outside of being the actual fire chief and managing the overall program, nobody has more uh, responsibility than the person who is managing the actual training program. If we start to take a look at some of those responsibilities uh, of the training officer, that we can just look at a couple of these numbers and realize that, wow, there's a lot to do. Okay, so the training officer needs to develop a plan to meet the training requirements. They're also gonna need to develop a process uh, to assess the skill, what skill level each firefighter is at and what skill level you want them to get to, all right? They're gonna to need to develop presentations of a lesson to teach them those skills. And you also have to, first off, identify the requirements of what you need to meet uh, on an annual basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. You have to develop a schedule to present your lessons. And then you have to have a delivery of each training session to a captive audience, which can be challenging itself, just getting people to show up to drill for uh, change. We need to identify what training is needed, who needs to be trained, and what training they're going to have to get. We got to develop lessons for those sessions when we teach that training. And then we got to record every single training session that we do. And then we have to identify the skill level of the people that we're teaching while we're teaching them and maintain the records that are going on. So as you can see here, there's quite a list of things that the fire training officer is responsible for. And this is only a list of 10 separate things that we came up with just for this introduction. This list can get quite extensive uh, if we were to list every single bullet point that the training officer is responsible for. So uh, the obvious question comes up is how do we 
take care of this. We have so much going on. There's so many responsibilities. There's so many requirements of, uh, of the management of a fire service training program. How do we, how do we, how do we take care of managing that? And the way we do that is through a five-step process. We take that, we eat the elephant one bite at a time, and we take the whole operation and break it down into five smaller parts. And that all starts with a needs assessment. So we identify the needs of what the fire department uh, has to have for training. What are the needs of the people that we're going to be training? And what are the needs of the organization itself? And that's where we're going to take a little bit of time today and spend uh, the majority of this presentation will be on that needs assessment and identifying uh, training requirements. Once we figure out those requirements, we have to develop a program to deliver the curriculum uh, uh, of what requirements there are. So we have to identify the requirements and then build a curriculum or develop a program that uh, delivers the actual training of the, the, the required uh, requirements. Then we put that into a logical operation where we operate the actual program and turn it into something that we can put out to all of our firefighters and all of the members of our organization. Once we've done that and we're operating the program and we have now boots on the ground and are, we're operating a, a, a program that is based on the development that, we, uh, that we, we came through through the identification of our training requirements, we have to see if the program is actually operating itself. And that's where we get into program evaluation. So we evaluate our own program to make sure that the training that we're putting forth is actually meeting the requirements that we identified in the beginning of the process. And then last, but absolutely not least, is a record and retention program that has to be managed. So if, we are, if we're not recording our training, then the training isn't getting done. So we have to have a plan and a process for managing record retention. And that's, that's going to vary from state to state as to exactly what records need to be kept, how they're to be kept, or how long they're going to be kept, and then how we destroy those records or remove those records when we no longer need to keep them. So that's the five step process. And as I mentioned, we're gonna basically start out with that step one, that needs assessment. And we're gonna spend some time today talking about that needs assessment and identifying the actual training requirements that your organization needs to meet on an annual basis. So the needs assessment, when we look at this and we break it down, what is the fire department's, what is the organizational needs of the department? What training needs to be done? We can break that into two separate categories. And those categories are internal needs. So what are the internal needs of the organization? And external needs. So the external needs are things that come from outside of the organization. And those external needs are typically, they're going to be your laws. Okay, so uh, federal, state, and local laws. What, what laws require specific training? And that's going to vary on the state that you're in and what your local requirements are. And it's also going to identify our standards. So uh, our standard is, it comes from OSHA, the Office of Safety and Health Administration, and their standard, 1910-156. Uh, and the professional standard that we need to follow, um, or the recognized professional standard that we follow in the fire service is in the National Fire Protection Agency uh, standard 1001, and that's the standard for the professional firefighter, both firefighter one and firefighter two. And then we have our mandates. So mandates are... Uh, close the gap between laws and regulations. And they're often put forth by, uh, by the government who identifies a problem or an immediate need and then writes a mandate uh, to close that gap or that need. And this is where we find a lot of our sexual harassment type training, our workplace violence um, and bloodborne pathogens, specifically in New York State for bloodborne pathogens. Okay, but what we're going to discuss today, get a little bit deeper into, is those internal needs, the actual needs of the organization. How do we identify what training requirements we need? What do we need to train our people in? What are those requirements? Uh, and that's going to be based on organizational needs. So what is it that your organization does? Because what your organization does is going to identify the training need or the training requirement, you're going to have to train your people in the things that you do as an organization. Uh, that's going to come to us through uh, the OSHA Fire Brigade Standard, okay? and that's 29 CFR 1910-156. That's where we're going to find the uh, OSHA Fire Brigade Standard that's going to tell us exactly what are those 
requirements? What are those internal requirements that we have to train our people for? So there is some question as to how do we meet OSHA uh, requirements and who needs to meet OSHA requirements? And is my state uh, required to meet those OSHA standards? So first and foremost, OSHA applies to all 50 states as well as uh, provinces um, in the United States, okay? So it's all 50 states, but it varies on state as to what the actual requirement is going to be, okay? So what that basically breaks down to is state approved plans. So what happens is the state will approve uh, or get approved through OSHA, a plan as how they're going to meet the occupational safety and health requirements that are built into these regulations from OSHA. Uh, OSHA standards, OSHA regulations are passed by the Congress of the United States of America. Okay, so Congress actually passes the regulation or the requirement and then OSHA basically enforces those standards. That varies by state, uh, and the state is allowed to have an approved plan as to how they're going to meet those requirements. And there's three different ways that this happens across the country. And we can see here on this map. So let's start with the dark green. You'll see the dark green that goes straight up the center of the map. Those are federal OSHA states, okay? So what does that mean? That means that these states do not have state approved plans and the OSHA standard uh, that has to be met by private sector and federal employees. So that means that a private fire company here in Texas, we use Texas as an example, a private fire company existing in the state of Texas would have to follow the, uh, the uh, OSHA fire brigade standard 1910-156. If you had a, let's say, uh, maybe a VA fire department that was inside of Texas, they would have to follow uh, OSHA 1910-156, the fire brigade standard. Where it varies here is, let's say, a, mus a municipal fire department, like the uh, Houston fire department, would not have to follow the uh, OSHA uh, uh, standard or regulation because they are a municipality and they are not covered by the federal OSHA. That does not hold true in our states here that are kind of the light green color. So those states have OSHA approved plans and those plans are both for private sector and public employees. So that means our private fire companies in those locations have to follow OSHA 1910-156 and our public employees that are in those locations also have to follow OSHA 1910-156, that fire uh, brigade standard. So a firefighter in Fresno, California, even though he's employed by Fresno Fire Department, uh, it is a municipality, but it would follow under it would fall underneath the approved California state plan to meet the OSHA regulation. Now the other states that you see here, there's five other states, and they're the states that are kind of crossed out with lines. They also have OSHA state approved plans, but those are only for public employees. Okay private sector employees are covered by federal OSHA. So what happens in these states is a separate entity comes in and takes care of public employees. And that is known as PESH, and that's Public Employee Safety and Health Administration. So just, it gets kind of confusing and how it works with each state will vary. And it's important that you understand what your state, how you fit into this. Do you have an OSHA approved state plan? that protects both uh, or sees over both the private sector and public employees? Are you a federal OSHA plan where it's just a private sector and most federal employees? Or are you in one of these five states where it is an OSHA state approved plan, but uh, for public employees only and your private employees fall under federal OSHA regulations? But regardless, regardless here, okay? OSHA 1910-156, the fire brigade standard, can serve as a great foundation for developing a fire service training program. And this is how it works. So OSHA 1910-156 contains the requirements for the organization, how they train, what personal protective equipment that they give to their employees, and uh, how they establish their actual fire brigade itself, okay? And when we use the term fire brigade here, it doesn't just mean, or it does not just imply industrial fire brigade. It's talking about fire departments, fire protection districts, fire districts, fire departments. Uh, it's a general statement that includes 
all forms of uh, uh, fire service organizations. Okay, so now the next question that we get often here is, are volunteer firefighters employees? So are they employees? And the answer to that is yes. Under common law rules, volunteer firefighters are employees. And you'll see that the OSHA uh, regulation uh, constantly refers to the employee and the employer, okay? The employer is going to be the fire department or however your fire department is organized, might be a fire district. And then the actual volunteer firefighter is the employee. And this has been proved in federal court as well as uh, other lawsuits that have happened at the state level that carried into the federal court. Uh, it was proved in Montour Falls, New York, uh, through a lawsuit that uh, the fire department was trying to uh, say that they're, uh, they're, uh, um, the volunteers are, are separate from being an actual employee. And that's not true. Under common law rules, a volunteer firefighter is an employee. And the reason for that is when they are subject to the will and control, all right? Uh, in other words, if you are managing your organization and you're telling the volunteer how they are going to operate or work, then they are, yes, uh, uh, an employee of your fire department uh, who is expected to perform the services in the way that you are telling them they should. So they are absolutely employees. So this does apply to employees who are volunteer firefighters. So now 1910-156 starts to break down exactly what the requirement of a fire brigade is. And it starts with an organizational statement. And that organizational statement that is the policy that basically uh, establishes the existence of the organization. It tells you exactly how the fire department is organized and what the fire department actually is. This policy will identify uh, what is the organizational structure of the, of, the, of the fire department or fire district? Who is the leader of said organization? And how does the hierarchy of management work? It's also going to describe the function of the organization. What does this organization do? Is this organization, has this, been, has this organization been found to protect uh, uh, employees and, and occupants of a certain industrial company from uh, hazardous materials, or is this a, uh, a village fire department that's protecting its population from uh, uh, fires that have appeared in structures and buildings and so on and so forth, okay? So it's going to say the exact function of the organization. And it's also going to identify the type, the amount, and the frequency of training. <clears throat> the organizational statement is also going to go on and basically say who you are. So how many members do you have? What does your leadership uh, hierarchy look like? What do you do? So what are the actual functions performed and what services are provided? Do you provide EMS? Do you provide um, structural firefighting? Do you provide auto extrication? Do you provide water rescue? What services does your organization provide? And how do you prepare is the other thing that they want to know. What type of training? How frequently do you train? And what is the overall amount of training that is expected of your membership? Okay, so if we're going to perform this internal needs assessment and identify the requirements that are coming to us through OSHA 1910-156 for every need standard, we're going to take and break this needs assessment up into a three-phase system, where phase one will identify your what, so what is the actual training need that's required. Phase two is going to identify when are you going to do that, do that training. So uh, when, at what point do you do certain amounts of training and how often you're going to have to do that training. And then phase three is going to help us identify how to do that training. How do we conduct the training? How are we getting this training out to the people who actually need it within our organization? So this is how we're going to conduct our needs assessment. And we'll start right out with phase one. How do I identify the what? Well, if we look again at OSHA 1910-156, this comes from C1 of that um, standard, the employer shall provide training and education for all fire brigade members commensurate with those duties and functions fire brigade members are expected to perform. Now, this is a critical, critical, critical point uh, in identifying what our training needs are. So what this is basically telling us is if we expect an employee, all right, or a volunteer firefighter to take a ladder from a fire apparatus rig and apply it to a building during a building fire, OK, 
Okay, we have to train that firefighter to handle that ladder and move that ladder prior to them performing it on the fire ground itself. So there used to be this thing called on the job training. And that's what OSHA kind of really tried to get every fire department to move away from. They didn't like the idea of on the job training. On the job training meant that you got on the fire truck and when you got to the fire, the older members of the fire department showed you exactly how to do the job. The OSHA way of looking at things as well as the NFBA way of looking at things is that we train the firefighters to have the skill of the job we want them to perform prior to arriving on the fire ground. And that becomes a critical step. And this is very true for initial training. So if it's the first time we're gonna have a member perform an operation on the fire ground, let's use the ladder thing. They're gonna take a ladder from the rig, throw it up against the building and then climb that ladder. We need to train the firefighter how the ladder operates, how to carry the ladder, how to throw the ladder, and how to climb the ladder, both safely, effectively, and efficiently. So they need to have um, competency in that skill yeah, before we can allow them to perform that skill on the fire ground itself. Now, once they've initially learned that skill, we can retrain the firefighters or assess their skill while they're performing it on the fire ground. But the first time that initial training has to happen outside of a hostile environment, it has to happen in a controlled environment on the training ground before we get to the fire ground. That's the whole idea. And that's exactly what OSHA is trying to tell us here. Okay, so internal training requirements. These can be based on the organizational function, okay? This is the type, the amount, and the frequency of training, and you're going to do that according to function. And that function is gonna be, if you're a structural firefighting fire department, if you go to structure fires, then you're going to have to train your people in fire suppression. You're gonna to have to train them how to manage hoses, how to operate fire streams, what fire stream to choose in what situation, where to apply the water, how to move the hose from inside, from outside to inside the building, so on and so forth. We're also going to have to train those firefighters on tactical ventilation, what it means to ventilate the building, what it means to introduce fresh air into the building, and what it means to exhaust bad air out of the building. We're also going to have to train them on how to rescue people, how to search for victims, how to remove victims from the building itself, so on and so forth. So for a structural fire department, these are the duties that are commensurate to our structural firefighter. And these are going to all add up to all different skills and different requirements that we're going to have to uh, put into our training program when we get to the part of building the actual program itself. So most fire departments do do some structural firefighting, okay? But if your fire department also responds to motor vehicle accidents and your firefighters are expected to perform extrication from a vehicle, then we need to train firefighters commensurate to that duty as well. And the same now would hold true for hazardous materials incidents. At what level are your firefighters expected to respond to a hazardous materials incident? Are they just going to respond and identify that, hey, we have a hazardous materials incident and then ask for the experts to come in? So in other words, they're at an awareness level or are the firefighters expected to respond to a hazardous materials incident Identify the material as something that they can work with, such as maybe a Freon leak, or maybe it's a, a gasoline leak from a tank, and the firefighter is allowed to put a plug or a, uh, uh, into the tank itself, or dike the leak itself, that's an operational level, or are they allowed to go in and actually shut down tanks, remove um, uh, the hazard itself in more of a technical um, uh, level of hazardous materials. Depending on what level we have, uh, our firefighters are expected to respond to, is what we have to train those firefighters to. And the same holds too for all of our technical rescue. If our firefighters are expected to perform technical rescue, then they have to be trained in that specific technical rescue. Here in this case, we're seeing a water rescue. Well, these firefighters had to have been trained in how to operate in swift water uh, rescue operations. Same holds true for our FAST team. So if your fire department is expected to respond as a rapid intervention crew, then your firefighters need to be specifically trained in the rescue of other firefighters and how your rapid intervention crew or RIT team operates. If your fire department has a boat, if you have a Marine unit, then the firefighters who operate the Marine unit have to be trained in Marine firefighting skills, just as they would have been trained in land-based firefighting operations. And they need to understand their vehicle 
uh, on the water and understand the watercraft as well as they would understand an engine company operating on the land. So I think you kind of get the gist here. Uh, this is what functional training looks like, okay? Firefighters have to be trained according to the function that they're expected to be performing. So fire brigade leaders and fire instructors, they're a little bit different. So not only do they need to be trained in all of the things that we just talked about, but they also have to have a little bit of an expertise in each one of those uh, uh, areas that they're going to be teaching. Now, that doesn't mean that a fire instructor needs to have expert knowledge of all areas, but they absolutely have, to have some expert knowledge of the area that they're training in or the part that they're teaching. So 1910-156 C1 tells us that fire brigade leaders and training instructors shall be provided with training and education, which is more comprehensive than that provided by the general membership of the fire brigade. And this only makes sense. The people who are going to be leading our operation need to have more training than the people who are performing the operation. And then the people who are going to be instructing those who are leading the operation and performing the operation should have yet even more higher uh, education than those that are below them. So fire instructors, they should have formal training in several different topics, okay? And this is going to include preparation, presentation, application and evaluation. This is where our fire instructors really need to understand how to prepare a lesson, how to present the lesson, how to apply that lesson and apply the skills that they're teaching and how do they evaluate or coach firefighters who are trying to teach uh, these new skills too. Okay, so that's phase one, which is already quite extensive. So, but now we've made our identify, uh, we've identified exactly what we need to be training and who needs to be training and to what level they need to be training. Now we're going to identify when they need to be training, okay? And that takes us to 1910-156-C2. And basically the employer shall assure that training and education is conducted frequently enough that each member of the fire brigade is able to perform the member's assigned duties and functions satisfactorily and in a safe, effective, efficient manner. So what do they need? They need competence. Okay? They need competent knowledge and skill. And that knowledge and skill is going to come directly from our NFPA standard, 1001, and that's going to identify what knowledge they need to have to perform certain skills and what skills they need to have to perform those on the fire ground. And we can separate those. So what does knowledge mean? Knowledge means that if we take that ladder example that we gave in the beginning of this, we'll keep, continue with the uh, with that ladder example for the rest of this webinar, the firefighter needs to understand if they're gonna throw a ladder and climb a ladder, then their knowledge needs to be what parts of the ladder are there? How is the ladder constructed? What is the ladder made of? What do you call the parts of the ladder so they can reference them? What are the safety concerns? What are the hazards when operating with the ladder? And how do they overcome or mitigate those hazards so they can reduce their risk while operating that? Uh, that specific skill. That's the knowledge part of it. And then there also comes the skill portion of that. So what skills does the firefighter need to understand in order to operate a ground ladder? Well, they, under, they need to understand, first off, the hazards associated with it so that they realize that they, if they have some overhead power lines, they can't raise the ladder. And play. There's a safety aspect of that skill. Then they need to understand also how to carry the ladder safely so that they're not causing themselves a musculoskeletal injury by carrying the ladder. Then they need to know how to appropriately put the ladder up or raise the ladder. They also need to understand how to climb the ladder using three points of contact. And that skill that they're developing as they carry, throw, and climb the ladder, what we want that skill eventually to be is we want it to be a muscle memory type operation where they don't even have to think about what they're doing. They can just focus back on that safety or that hazard thing that we talked about uh, earlier. Okay, so it says that all fire brigade members shall be provided with training at least annually. So at least annually, the firefighter needs to be trained on that ladder operation. That's what 1910-156-C2 tells us. Interior firefighters, however, firefighters who are going to go into the burning building, they need to be provided with an education uh, or training session that happens at least quarterly. Okay? So that the interior skills that firefighters are learning they need to be taught those or you need to review those on a quarterly basis. So that's basically focusing on our SCBA. 
And at Vigilant, we have the concept or we teach the concept of mastering skills uh, that have to uh, that are related to fire ground operation. And we say that if you can master the skills of hose, ground ladders, and SCBA or PPE, SCBA and PPE, then you'll be able to, to effectively perform the job of a firefighter. So if we're, if we're only learning some of those skills once a year, uh, those, some of those skills might fall away and you might not be as fresh as when we actually need them to have to, to come about. So the SCBA is probably the biggest skill that we need to understand. Uh, and it's also the same skill that's going to be responsible for most of our safety on the fire ground. So OSHA here is saying, let's do that at least quarterly. Okay, so once we've identified all the training that we need to do, and we identify how often we need to do that actual training, we need to identify exactly how we're going to come up with that training. How are we going to deliver that training? How are we going to take the training that we've identified and built and deliver it to our members? So 1910-156 uh, C3 tells us that the quality of that training and education program must be the same of the state-run fire academy and curriculum. So depending on what state that you're in, that curriculum that you're delivering to your firefighters should be that the same of your state run fire cat. So uh, what they're looking for here is they're looking for a program uh, that has been developed based on a standard curriculum, which is maybe ISTA, maybe it's uh, Del Mar. It depends on what every state is. And that curriculum is then delivered in a logical sequence. And that's, that's how we deliver our training program, okay? We, we develop that program. We base it on the needs that we have identified that our firefighters have to, have to conduct. We take a standard curriculum. Uh, so using the ladder example, it's very standard to call the side of the ladder the beam and the steps of the ladder the rung and so on and so forth. And then we teach that to our firefighters in a logical sequence. And that's going to be the how. And maybe the ground ladder, oh, those skills are so well ingrained in our firefighters, that only needs to be taught once a year. But our SCBA, maybe that needs to be done monthly because it's such a critical aspect of, of the firefighting operation. So that is our needs assessment. That's how we perform a good needs assessment. We identify those requirements, okay? And then we basically develop a, 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 a idea of uh, how often we need to train on those requirements and then come up with a plan to deliver that to our, our, our members. So that's the needs assessment. Once we start getting into that program development, now we're going to take that, that how often and how we're going to do it, and we're going to really develop that into something that is a logical type sequence that the firefighters can take and retain. Because retention of these skills, once we teach them, is going to be the next most critical aspect. So how do we develop a program that does that? So basically, the training program is developed based on those needs that we, uh, that we found through uh, the organizational statement. But what we're going to do now is we're going to take each one of those needs uh, uh, found in the assessment and turn them into a job description. So we're going to turn those job descriptions and develop them to meet the needs of the organizational statement. So if we are a structural firefighting fire department, then we're going to create a job description for interior structural fire fighters. And that job description is going to be developed for every single position uh, that we have on the fire ground or within the organization. So that's not just our firefighters, but it's also going to be for our fire instructors, our uh, company officers, our incident command officers, maybe we have just members who are in support, who are just filling air bottles. We have to write job descriptions for each one of those positions. And then that's what we call the job performance requirement. So we take the job description and we build individual skills or individual job performance requirements and create a list of those skills for each job description. So JPR is described the performance that's required for a specific job, okay? And then we group those according to tactic and task. And basically the JPRs, they define the skill that every firefighter must be capable of doing to perform the duty within their job description. And we base those JPRs on the skills that are identified in the NFPA 1001, which is the standard for 
uh, uh, firefighter one and firefighter two. So if we went back and we looked at our ladder example that we've been using throughout this webinar, the raising of the ladder is a JPR, it's a job performance requirement. So for a firefighter to operate the ladder, they have to be able to safely carry the ladder, raise the ladder and climb the ladder. So we're identifying those requirements that are built within that performance that they're required to do to complete their job. So we would, we would create a job performance requirement that says they must be able to carry the ladder in such a manner, raise the ladder in such a manner, and climb the ladder in such a manner. And that would be repeated, not just for the ladder skill, but for hose skills, SCBA management, so on and so forth. For each skill that the firefighter is required to perform according to their job description. Once we, the, once we identify these skills and these job performance requirements, now we're gonna develop some curriculum to teach them how to actually perform the job that we want them to do. So we develop lessons to deliver the knowledge and skill that's required for those job performance requirements. And then we're gonna develop some delivery methods to present each lesson. And those methods, they're gonna be based on knowledge and skill requirement. And they're gonna vary. They're gonna be a little bit different for each knowledge and each skill because we wanna present these in a logical way where the firefighter is able to retain them relatively easily. So some of our delivery methods, the two methods that we most often use are training and drilling. And oftentimes we confuse these two uh, terms across the board. There is an absolute difference between training and drilling, even though some fire instructors would still use these words interchangeably. Training is the formal method of teaching somebody a new skill or some new knowledge. Okay, so this is where we, we sit them down. We have a formal method, a formal way of introducing the new knowledge or skill that we want you to do. It's the way that we're going to show them what right looks like. Okay, so that's what we want to do. We want to put them in front of a uh, presentation and show them exactly what the expectation is and exactly what that knowledge or that skill looks like when performed correctly. The drilling part of it is where we actually allow that firefighter now to practice that new knowledge or new skill. So again, we'll use the latter thing. So at some point in a formal training session, we show the firefighter or we show the, 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 the firefighter exactly what that ladder looks like, what the parts of the ladder are, how to raise the ladder, how to climb the ladder, and we introduce that in a formal training setting. Then we take the firefighter out on the drilling grounds and we allow them to practice that skill of carrying the ladder, raising the ladder, climbing the ladder. So we have other delivery methods and those delivery methods are used basically either for the training or for the drilling session. Lecture and discussion uh, or a presentation is used really well for that formal training uh, idea. And then demonstration and video is used to really uh, show the firefighter some how, how to perform good skills. So lectures and discussions, uh, they're instructor-led presentations, okay? And we usually use PowerPoints that deliver knowledge. So the difference between a lecture, a discussion, and a presentation is a lecture is what I'm doing here right now. I can interact with you through chat, but I can't even see the chat. So you'd be, you'd be working with Chris if you were to chat right now or ask a question. So you really have no ability to talk with me, the instructor, ask me a question one-on-one. -on -one. You're just kind of there listening. And then maybe later on, you could ask a question when we get into a setting. If we we're having a discussion, you'd be allowed to come in and talk to me directly. Uh, so as I'm teaching you what we're talking about here today, you could stop me and say, hey, oh, hold on, uh, I got a question here. And then we can have a nice little discussion about what's going on while I'm continuing to present the lesson that we're showing. Okay, so we kind of like using discussions and presentations way over lectures. Lectures are hard. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to really connect with the student in the lecture format. But it's again, this is where we're doing this to present some new knowledge or skill. Demonstration is where we show the skill, we show what it looks like. So we're showing that either through a live demonstration or we're showing it what it looks like on video at, at, uh, with, with some uh, multimedia presentation. Okay, so then the next part is we actually drill or we actually use that skill and, and make it happen. And then once we practice that skill, we'll do an evolution or a scenario where we're actually applying the skill. So during a skill drill, this is where we practice those skill requirements. And during that practice, we're developing muscle memory at this point, okay? So, and what's happening is the instructor here is acting as a coach uh, to help, help 
develop that skill. And what we're talking about with muscle memory is we want a firefighter to get so good with muscle memory or so good at a skill that they don't have to worry about performing the skill anymore. They just have to worry about the hazards that are around them. And muscle memory uh, is, is a really unique thing. So a lot of times muscle memory um, uh, is something we don't even think about. And that's the whole idea of it. it's being able to do something without actually physically thinking about the actions themselves. The evolution scenario, that's where we apply that new skill or knowledge in a real actual uh, operation that is still in a controlled environment. So we're not, at the, we're not on the fire ground yet, we're still in a training ground, but we're, we're acting as if it was a fire ground, but in a controlled environment. So that's our program development. So once we develop that program, we now have to figure out how we're gonna operate this program. So we have all of our curriculum developed, we, we, we've, we've built some lessons, we've built some, some, some drills, we've built a couple of different things. How do we apply it? How do we put this into a methodology is what we're gonna be talking about now. How do we put it into a methodology that really works for the firefighter so that they understand and retain the knowledge that we're trying to teach them? And that's our program operation. Okay, so uh, the program methodology that we use here at Vigilant is something called proficiency cycle training, and it's a cycle that builds competency through repetition. It always starts with training, and it only ends when we have mastered the skill uh, or the knowledge in the end. Okay, and this is kind of how it looks. So we start with that formal training where we introduce that new concept or skill. This is where we do that formal presentation format. Okay, this is our PowerPoint presentation where we're showing them the new thing. We then allow them to perform that, that skill or that concept through repetitive practice. And the way that we teach that is through something called the five-step uh, psychomotor process, which is something we'll talk about a little bit deeper in another webinar. But here we're drilling, we're coaching, we're allowing them to practice that new skill or that new piece of knowledge that we've given them. Once they practice it for a while, we apply it in an evolution. This applies that skill. Uh, in, a, in, in this simulation where they can actually use it in real time, but in a safe environment. And at the same time, we're doing this evolution, we're evaluating the firefighter and what that looks like. And this, this is how we, we assess that skill or that concept through something we call a company competency. So we're not individually pulling the firefighter out to make them throw a ladder for us or pull a hose or perform an SCBA emergency uh, situation, we're having the company apply themselves in an evolution, and then we're rating to see how that company operates and how the individual skills are happening within that evolution itself. So we're evaluating that skill. Now, if during that skill, we saw a firefighter performing a vent under search operation and he threw a ladder upside down, then we would probably need some skill remediation. So the next step after evaluation is remediation of skill and maybe that requires some more training. We take some deficiencies that we were identifying during that evolution evaluation, and we develop a new plan to start training that firefighter again and putting them back through the proficiency loop cycle, and we'll continue that until there's mastery. So it just continues all the way around with remediation training, so on, drilling, evolution, evaluation training, until we reach that mastery level. And once we have that mastery level in the middle, two things can happen. We just continue to uh, uh, maintain that mastery of skill, or we take a firefighter to the next level and introduce the next level skill and, until we develop mastery in that. So when we're talking about our ground ladder, maybe we started them out with a suitcase carry and a two-person raise, and then the next part is developing mastery of teaching them how to do a high shoulder uh, carry in a high shoulder raise where they can then throw that 24 foot ladder all by themselves. And we practice that through training, drilling, evalu evolution, evaluation, remediation until there's mastery in that skill as well. So once we develop this cycle of training where we're going to introduce some training, then we're going to drill on it, and then we're going to uh, e evaluate that through an evolution, we put all that together into an annual training program. So we take that proficiency cycle curriculum and we put it all together into one plan. And then that plan is gonna use a logical sequence to deliver the entire program into little bits of manageable blocks. Kind of like what we're talking about here today. There's a hundred things we need to get done to manage this uh, training program. But what we're doing is breaking them down into individual little blocks. And those individual manageable blocks, depending on what it is, we might have to do this weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. 
Okay. So it's best to have some form of training every single week. And then maybe every two weeks we're doing a uh, simple company drill. And then maybe monthly we're doing multi-company drill. And then maybe quarterly we do an entire evolution where we're simulating an actual real fire. And then on an annual basis, we might be hitting some of those mandates or those things that we're required to do, but we don't need to be uh, refreshing our firefighters on those things uh, on, a, on a more frequent basis. So we develop that training plan into a session schedule. So we take all of the things we need to meet in that report in that in that training plan, and we break it out into a weekly session schedule. And we start every topic, every new topic with a training presentation, and we follow it with a skill drill, and we apply it to an evolution. And then we, we test the company to see how well they're doing at that new knowledge or that new skill through a company competency. The training plan uh, <clears throat> is, is probably our, our, our biggest um, component for satisfying the training requirements of, of everyone. It allows our fire instructors to see exactly what needs to be trained. It allows the uh, management team, uh, our fire chiefs, the, the, the chief staff, to understand exactly what's going on uh, at, the, at the boots level of training. And the other thing it does is it allows our firefighters, our adult learners, to understand what the expectation is. And it's really important when we're talking about teaching adults. Adults need to know what's expected of them. And that training plan is a great way of showing them uh, what exactly is expected of them throughout the year. So now we've got a program that's up and running and we're managing that program. And we're going through the, the training, drilling, uh, evolution, evaluation process. Everything's going good. How do we know if we're actually being successful with our training that we're teaching? And that turns into the program evaluation. So we need to evaluate the program, just like we're evaluating firefighter skill. We must make sure that the program is, uh, is, is, is working for the firefighters. In other words, it's delivering that knowledge and skill efficiently. Okay? So leadership has to have an understanding of how effective the program is being. If we're constantly showing up to, the, to uh, uh, these fire scenes, and maybe we have a company that just is not understanding how to operate their forecast meter, then it's time to, to look at, is the training there? Is the training working for the forecast meter? They're getting training on the forecast meter on a bi-monthly process or a bi-monthly schedule, but they're not retaining this. Is it, the, is it the firefighters or is it the actual program itself? So we, we got to evaluate that program. We got to evaluate the lessons, the presentations, and the instructors themselves. Some instructors may be more well suited to teach newer firefighters, and some fire instructors may not be suited for teaching newer firefighters, and maybe we have to keep them with the seasoned firefighters. Um, this all depends, uh, and it all varies by fire department to fire department, but we can only figure this out through an evaluation. Okay? Now, we can manage this program through pre- and post-testing, and that doesn't mean that we sit our firefighters down and have them uh, take a 100-question test in January and then a 100 question test the following December. There are better ways of doing this. We can manage this through fun games um, and using technology that's available to us. And there's many programs that are out there like this. Uh, uh, there's, there's games that the guys can actually uh, challenge each other. Uh, then you can follow on, on their phones where you can have, have everyone uh, download uh, the actual game app onto their phones and then you can put in questions and they can all answer questions from their phones. There's different ways of doing this. We'll dive deeper into this portion of it later on in a future webinar here. Okay, so we've evaluated the program now, the program's operating. The next thing we need to do is we need to make sure that we're, we're performing our record retention properly. And unrecorded training is training that did not happen. So no matter what, what level your state is at, if you have an OSHA inspector come in or a PASH inspector for the, for the states that have PASH, uh, they're, if their training is not marked down, then it didn't happen. And this is also going to hold true even for fire departments, maybe municipality in Texas that doesn't have to worry about an OSHA inspector coming in. This is going to hold true for a lawyer who's coming in to look at a lawsuit. OK, uh, or litigate a lawsuit uh, if it's not recorded and it did not happen. It's not going to be presentable in court either. So we have to record every individual training session. We record those with a training report and the training report is going to say exactly what we did, what the objectives were met during that training and who was attending that training. 
We're also going to have to take individual training records of our individual members and create permanent records for them. And we want to put in those training records all the training uh, that they have completed. Um, uh, and that, so that includes their initial training as well as their annual and service training and any external training they have done outside uh, of the fire department itself. So all training records are maintained according uh, to the state uh, schedule. So in New York State, which is where I am out of currently, uh, New York State has regulations as to how you even destroy your records, how long you keep each record, uh, how long every record needs to be maintained, depending on the record itself. And that's called a training record schedule, right? Or an MU1 schedule. It's actually not, not just training records, it's more records uh, than just training records. But every state itself will be able to tell you uh, exactly what records you need to keep how long you need to keep them, and then what to do with them or how to get rid of them once you are ready to do so. Okay. Okay, so uh, in New York State, they're maintained is something called the LGS-1. It depends on what state you are in, what that will be called there. Um, but records, uh, you know, no matter what state you're in, they include paper and digital forms. And that's our training uh, reports, bulletins, memos, there is a, there's a schedule for every little part and what happens here and the reason why it becomes so important and what they're looking for, what each state is looking for is there might be uh, litigated um, lawsuits later on in life. And one of the ones we're seeing right now is firefighters who have come in contact with, uh, with foam. Um, cancer is a huge thing in the fire service right now. And there's only gonna be more and more lawsuits that are going back to understand exactly what firefighters are coming in contact with. Because now what we have is we have states who are paying out uh, millions of dollars in cancer benefits to their firefighters. Well, those states are gonna to wanna to recoup the money uh, and insurance companies are also gonna to wanna to recoup those costs and those, the, their funds as well. And that all, all happens through litigation and through suing the manufacturers of, of products. So this is why, maintaining some training records is so important. So we can go back and look at, uh, you know, maybe we had 10 firefighters who all came down with cancer in one fire department. And we go back and we look and uh, uh, they were exposed to PCBs during uh, a training live fire burn that actually had occurred 15 years prior. Uh, that's just one example of, as to why we maintain training records the way that we do, okay. So as I said, uh, we'll dive deeper into the record retention portion of this uh, in a later webinar uh, as well. Okay, so with that, I think we'll close it up here and uh, I'll turn it over to Chris to see if there's any questions out there or anything that uh, you guys would like to have answered. Maybe something we brushed over too quickly or something you'd like us to cover again. Let Chris know in the chat and we'll get right back to you. All right, I think we are uh, good to go. Thanks so much, Todd. I want to thank you for joining us for week two of the Managing Fire Service Training Webinar Series. Please be on the lookout for the remainder of the series and be sure to sign up. We would love the opportunity to work more closely with you and to help you accomplish your training goals. Our system can help you provide your organization with training, tracking, and managing your fire service training program. So please head to cypherworks.com for more information. Be sure to save the certificate that you'll receive for your professional development records, and we look forward to seeing you in the future. I hope you have a great day. Thanks so much.